Hello and welcome to the My Ministry Mission podcast, where I'm taking you on a journey with me from unbeliever to disciple of Christ. As a Christian young in his faith, I'll share with you what I've learned as I seek a position of ministry in my life. I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com and to find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. My name is Jason, and this is my mission. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Ministry Mission. If you're feeling stressed out and you feel like you're at the end of your rope, I urge you to listen to this episode. We've all been in that position where our circumstances in life having us feel as if we're trapped or hopeless, yearning for a more peaceful life. What if I told you that right now you could start taking steps to make things better? Would you listen? Would you give it a chance? I've given this episode the title of Peace Be With You, a phrase that Jesus used when he first appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. What does this actually mean and how does it impact you? Those are just a couple of the questions I try to answer in this episode as we discuss dealing with our worldly stress and finding peace through godly means. We live in a turbulent world, and stress is a big part of our lives. Not that you need any proof, but check out these statistics. 55% of Americans are stressed out during the day. Globally, across 143 countries, 35% of people are reporting they're stressed out. One in five college students report thoughts of suicide. Upwards of 63% of U.S. workers are ready to quit their jobs to avoid work-related stress. 63%. 48% of the people in the United States report having sleep issues caused by stress. And millennials are reporting an average stress level of 5.7 on a scale of 1 to 10. On top of our daily stresses, during the holiday seasons when we're supposed to be focusing on gratitude for our blessings, family, and celebrating the birth of Christ, 25% of the people report feeling extreme stress. I don't know about you, but reading these statistics on stress in this country and across the world, it hurts my heart. I, I can empathize with many of these statistics. When I think of the phrase, peace be with you, it calms my soul and brings me peace. It really does. I wish I could live there all the time. But, but we do have jobs, we have families, friends, obligations, schools, housework, bills. The list goes on and on and on. But maybe we can visit peace with the help of Christ. Maybe we can strive to live in a life where peace is not something we have to take PTO to find. I want to go over the depths of the term peace be with you and see how it's used in the Bible so that we can reflect on that a bit. And then let's talk about what we can do to leverage that peace to quiet our world and bring stress down a few notches. Once you take a step back, you'll probably realize that things may not be as bad as you thought. And with God's help, you can live a joyful life amidst the chaos that surrounds you all the time. So, of course, the first question is, where did you find peace be with you? Well, as Christians, we are all familiar with the crucifixion, death, and burial of Jesus. And then, of course, his resurrection in the empty tomb. I'm going to wait until we get closer to Easter to go into that in more detail in a separate episode. So I'm going to skip ahead to John 20, 19. When Jesus appeared to 10 of his disciples after his resurrection, Thomas wasn't there, so it was only 10 of them. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. So here are 10 of the disciples all huddled together with the door shut and locked in fear of what the Jewish leaders are going to do to them. I mean, they just brutally flogged and crucified Christ. But Jesus is greater than doors. I mean, you can't shut and lock him out forever. He stood amongst them and said, peace be with you. That was the first words he said to them, peace be with you. So this phrase, peace be with you, consisted of two Greek words. Irene, for peace, and su, means with you. So the first word, Irene, really represents peace, like a security, safety, prosperity, even tranquility. And in terms of Christianity, it's the tranquility that a soul gets when it's assured of its salvation through Christ. It means we fear nothing from God and have complete contentment with our earthly lives exactly where we are. It seems to me Jesus was telling these disciples, you have nothing to fear for I have brought you salvation. So we'll continue on through John 20 verses 20 through 22. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sight. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So Jesus assured them he was the real deal by showing him the wounds of his crucifixion, and then he granted them the blessing of peace once again. 
Jesus gave his disciples a mission to continue his work in this world. The mission that our Heavenly Father started with Jesus. And then he gave the disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit, bringing them new life to carry out the mission. This represents sort of a recreation. Just as God breathes life into man in Genesis, he is now giving new life to the disciples through his breath. So when I thought about the title for this episode, the blessing, Peace Be With You, seemed very appropriate. While the topic is really dealing with the mountain of stresses in our lives that can create problems and create anxiety, the purpose of this episode is to share a message of peace from our Lord. The gift of salvation from Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit, which can fill us with peace, tranquility, and contentment, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. So this idea of peace sounds wonderful, doesn't it? When you imagine a peaceful scene in your mind, what do you, what do you picture? Sitting on the beach, listening to the ocean waves cascade and recede, maybe hearing leaves chitter in the woods as a breeze blows through them, perhaps peaceful as taking a long horseback ride on a ranch in Montana or skiing in Telluride. We often picture peace in terms of where we are or what we're doing. But what if peace came to us instead of the other way around? Regardless, living a peaceful life has a very special appeal to us humans, yet we seem to do everything in our power to destroy peace around us and within us. Why is that? Understanding what peace is may help shift this perspective away from what or when and get us to focus on how and who instead. Maybe if we take a little time to see what wonderful gifts we have from Christ, maybe we'll preserve our peace instead of sabotaging it. Let's see if we can get a better definition of peace. Now, in secular terms, peace represents a sense of well-being. You might also consider it like a being in harmony or in a state of tranquility. However, when you add the Christian faith into the equation, peace takes on a much deeper meaning. In short, it's a sense of spiritual restoration, and the peace of God is much different, much more rich than the peace of the world. Many people frame peace as being without conflict, and the, but in biblical terms, you can be at peace even during conflict. Now, if you're hoping that I'm going to give you some kind of step-by-step -step to gain peace that's 100% foolproof, that's probably not how this is going to work, because we cannot create biblical peace on our own. Peace is the fruit of the vine, the source of it being God. It takes time and dedication to Jesus to bear that fruit because Jesus is the source of peace within God. He is the source of peace with others, and he is the source of peace within ourselves. Now, the Old Testament anticipates peace, and the New Testament confirms that God's peace would be mediated through the Messiah. So what do I mean by this? Let's look at Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And who will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah is teaching us that the Messiah had to be a man, born as a child, not an angel, not even created as a fully grown man as Adam was. Furthermore, the child is the eternal Son of God, who was given to us. If we go back to Genesis 49, verses 8 through 12, we see that there is a foretelling of the coming of Jesus through the line of Judah when Jacob blessed his sons before he died. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's club, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down, like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. So in these verses, there are multiple references to positions of ruling, as a lion, the scepter, and lawgiver. And these are ruling positions that Judah will have over his brothers as firstborn. And firstborns were meant to eventually become kings. And then we have this part. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. This is a promise that Israel will keep its scepter, its rule, until he whom it belongs comes. Now in other translations it reads, until Shiloh comes. And the meaning of the word Shiloh is accepted in this passage as a messianic title. It's hard for me not to go down a rabbit hole when I stumble upon something like this, but I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here just for a second. Shiloh refers to, is referred to as a place of rest in Judges 21.19. And then if you look at Joshua 18.1-10, we see Shiloh is where the tabernacle was set up after the conquest. So where am I going with all of this? 
If we break it down to the most basic components, the Old Testament framed God as a source of peace, and God's peace would be mediated through the Messiah. Now, there is a relationship between righteousness and peace. Therefore, the closer we stay to righteousness through Jesus, the closer we get to peace from God. So what is peace? Peace is your relationship with God through Christ. I feel like this is illustrated really well in John 15, verses 1 through 4. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The fruit is that sense of peace that only comes from God. You want more proof? Look at Isaiah 32, 17. The fruit of the righteousness will be peace. Its effects will be quietness and confidence forever. Now here's the catch, and there's always a catch, right? Building a strong relationship with Christ takes time, consistency, and dedication, just as growing a vine does, which means you won't immediately gain peace from your efforts. I know people who have gone off excited to bear their fruits, and they give up because it's not happening fast enough. If you feel like giving up, that's the time you really need to lean into God through prayer, reading your Bible, join a small group. Just keep in Christ. Keep remaining in Christ. The enemy wants you to get frustrated and give up. Don't give him what he wants. All right, at this point in the episode, you're probably thinking, you've told me a lot of great stuff, Jason, but you haven't told me what I came here for, <laughs> which is how do we as Christians deal with stress and find some peace while we're waiting for that vine thing to happen? To answer this, I want to point you to Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. I really like how this starts by reminding us to rejoice two times. We all know there are plenty of stresses and concerns in this world, but there's also reasons to rejoice in what God has already done for us and what God continues to do. How you start your day will set the mood for the rest of your day. Now, I used to wake up and turn on the news, and I realized that it was tainting my view of the day with all the politics, the conflict, the bad news, the robberies, the murders, everything that was going on in the world that they want to focus on is bad, so I stopped. Instead, I begin my day with prayer, maybe some worship music, or I turn on a sermon or something and listen to some someone else uh, rejoice in God. Start your day with worship and rejoice. Don't start it with bad news. The verse goes on to say, let your gentleness be evident to all. But in other versions, it actually says, let your reasonableness be evident to all. Either way, we're being taught to be reasonable and be willing to coexist with others. And this will help remove some of that chaos and anxiety in the world. Then it goes on to direct us not to be anxious about anything because anxiety and peace can't exist together. They just can't. I know it sounds easier than it is, but we can take a lesson from 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. God loves you and he can handle your anxieties. There is no sense in worrying or stressing over situations and circumstances we have no control over. Practice taking those problems and handing them over to God. When you feel overwhelmed, take a moment to say a prayer. God, this is beyond my control to fix, but nothing is beyond your control. I trust that you will guide me through these challenges. And this really is a segue to the last part of the verse, which tells us to use prayer and petition with thanksgiving to present our request to God. In essence, let's replace stress and anxiety with prayer and let the peace of God start to comfort you in that moment. Let God help guard your heart from the ugly feelings you have and keep your thoughts on Christ. While you're building your relationship with Christ, here are just a few other things you can do to help reduce your stress and anxiety in the short term. The first thing is take time for yourself. Even if it's just a few minutes, step away from the source of your stress. Take some time to breathe and recover. Maybe start writing a list of things that you need to get done, then prioritize it. It's very hard to focus on a solution when you're surrounded by chaos. So step away and leave the problem alone for a bit. Sometimes when I feel overwhelmed, I just walk around the block. It helps. Or I might go to the park and commune with God's creations or even read the Bible sitting under a tree. Just, just get away. Number two is be mindful of what the real problem is. If you can identify the problem, you have a much better chance of finding a solution to your problem. Sometimes we try to resolve symptoms of the overarching problem, which leaves us feeling hopeless and defeated because we never get it fixed. Doing this also requires us to be humble enough to admit that we have a problem. 
Maybe even admit that we can't handle it alone and go ask for help. Don't beat yourself up because you can't fix something in your life, especially if it's a significant problem. Number three is to take some time to give thanks and praise. I mentioned it briefly a moment ago, but start counting your blessings. Look at the good things happening around you and in you. Take your mind away from focusing on the negatives by spending time searching for the positives because you can't do both at the same time. For number four, you may not feel like doing it, but get engaged with your friends and family and your church community. Fellowship will raise your spirits and helps to remind us that we have a community we can depend on in tough times. Maybe talk to a close friend, even if you don't get an answer or a resolution, just speaking to somebody about it who can empathize and be present in your struggles might be enough to help wash away some of the anxiety. And then number five, I want to really emphasize this one. If things are bad enough, please seek professional help. Find a good Christian counselor or talk to your pastor about setting up some counseling sessions. And if you ever, ever feel like harming yourself or others, then absolutely seek professional medical help immediately. Don't wait. Just go get it. God gave psychologists and psychiatrists gifts. Don't be afraid to seek help when you need it. Stress and anxiety can become debilitating, and it, it usually indicates that there's a distance between us and our Heavenly Father. Start building a routine that centers around worshiping God and serving Christ daily. Don't expect that going to church once a week to be enough. It's good to go to church, but we have to feed ourselves throughout the week. So make a daily commitment to spend time with God. Take some measures in the short term to help improve your situations, or at minimum, improve your perception of the situations. One thing we cannot expect is for God to do everything for us. We are expected to do what we are able to do, and God will do the rest. And remember that praying, worship, and serving does not mean you will be worry-free in your life. I think we all know that by now. Now let's finish in a prayer. Heavenly Father, if anyone is listening to this episode who is suffering stress and anxiety of this world, I pray that you come to meet them where they are with the peace that only you can provide. Deliver them from the turmoil and suffering by filling them with the Holy Spirit and guide them to a joyful lifestyle. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you again for joining me and listening to this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or episode suggestions, I urge you to visit my website at myministrymission.com. Click on the contact link, or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash myministrymission. Please remember to spend time with God every day. My name is Jason, and this is my mission.